Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar on the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation and Value-Based Care After COVID-19, Actions Needed to Achieve Care Transformation and Health Equity Goals. Now that's a mouthful, but it highlights the importance of CMMI in achieving some of the most important or addressing some of the most important challenges that we're facing in our healthcare system today. And really pleased to have all of you with us to uh, join in that timely discussion. I'd also like to thank West Health for making this webinar possible as part of a larger collaborative initiative between Duke Margolis and West. Uh, as we get into this discussion of how the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation can enable care transformation, promote health equity through value-based payment. And as you'll see, this isn't just an issue for government. It's an issue for all stakeholders in our healthcare system uh, working together around these shared goals, better outcomes, greater equity, uh, and lower healthcare costs. Uh, we are in the early, this is very timely because we're in the early stages of a new administration, one that is in the process of laying out a new and updated strategic vision for the innovation activities at CMS and how they fit into the broader agenda for the administration and for all of us working on improving uh, health and health care. Uh, and this is coming at a time when we're seeing uh, maybe the light at the end of the tunnel of the acute phase of the COVID-19 pandemic in the United States, where there have been a lot of lessons about problems with traditional ways of delivering care that were institution-based and, and paid under fee-for-service. So very important time to look back on what we've learned about payment reform and how to support important health care goals and looking forward as to the best ways to do it. So we're going to kick things off. If we're going to go to the, the first slide, um, I'm going to kick things off with uh, a um, discussion of um, a discussion with uh, Liz Fowler after I make a few uh, introductory remarks here um, on uh, the uh, future for uh, CMMI from, from her perspective. Very pleased to have Liz with us. Uh, then our first session uh, is going to be a panel discussion focusing on care transformations that CMMI can help enable and how the private sector and other uh, and states can support those efforts uh, uh, as well. And then our second session is going to focus on specific actions that CMMI in collaboration with others in the healthcare system can take to ensure that value-based payment uh, helps improve the uh, key health equity goals that are facing the nation today. Um, so we go to the next slide. Uh, uh, we're doing this uh, panel in conjunction with the release of a few documents supported by the Duke Margolis Center. Uh, members of our team have just published a two-part health affairs blog series describing 12 key lessons learned uh, from uh, payment reform efforts over the past decade plus. Uh, some of those we've included on the slide here. Uh, many of the payment reforms that we've implemented to date have been only modest shifts away from fee-for-service payments, and many of those have had very modest effects. Uh, we've also seen that while the goal of many of these payment reforms is to take a more whole person view about improving outcomes and lower costs, some of the unintended effects have come when we don't pay intentionally enough attention to issues like addressing health equities and, and the diversity of populations that are served uh, by our healthcare system. Uh, in addition, uh, the uh, focus on payment reform has often focused on payment reform instead of what payment reform is really intended to accomplish. And I want to talk more about uh, that uh, connection today. Uh, and we've learned that it takes a lot of effort, resources, investments, redesigns in care and whole organizational structures and cultures to succeed in making uh, the kinds of care transformation happen uh, that we hope to see throughout our healthcare system. That's not easy when you think about the best way to support uh, those efforts while recognizing that we don't have a whole lot of uh, excess money to spend on healthcare. And then finally, to get to system-wide impact, it's not enough just to have a whole series of uh, specific payment reform tests, but rather a uh, coherent uh, structure that's uh, founded on some core models and probably most important for that, uh, where people first connect and uh, center uh, their experience with the healthcare system is around primary care and the set of comprehensive services that are increasingly springing up around that through digital health technologies, home-based services, team-based approaches to care, and the like. And 
And finally, going along with these early days, we've seen most of the payment reforms that have been implemented do so on a voluntary basis. And for a host of reasons, patient selection and others, it's very difficult to save money in those voluntary programs. So uh, uh, thinking ahead involves a potentially larger role for mandatory models. Uh, on to the next slide, uh, wanted to uh, say we're also releasing a paper right now, uh, looking forward to report on lo looking ahead on value-based payment and high-value comprehensive care. Uh, this effort uh, by Duke Margolis was supported by a very distinguished and uh, diverse uh, advisory group that's listed on the slide here. You're going to hear from a number of them during the course of our uh, event today. And what the report uh, uh, focused on was a number of ways in which we can get to uh, the kind of transformed vision, uh, uh, laying out a clear vision. It's not just about payment reform for its own sake, uh, but how we can connect specific steps in payment reform and other supporting policies uh, to enable uh, a new kind of care experience. And we talk in the report in the next slide about what that experience should look like. And these are terms that many people who have been involved in trying to advance better models of healthcare to support better health and health equity and lower costs have talked about for some time, but still remain elusive for, for most Americans. Uh, the good news is we've seen lots of examples around the country of care that is comprehensive and longitudinal, that's inclusive, that's, that's proactive, that keeps people at home and connects them uh, and embeds them in their community, that's resilient uh, for challenges like COVID-19 but they are not yet widespread and they are not yet uh, secure and under traditional payments, they're, they're certainly not uh, financially sustainable. And so that leads to the connection in our report and some of the issues that we're gonna be discussing today uh, as the next slide shows around uh, what a comprehensive uh, strategy to get to payment reforms that support this, these kinds of care models would look like, uh, something that we're calling high value comprehensive care. And if you think about it, from this slide, it shows a set of um, uh, kinds of reforms that CMMI and that states and other stakeholders could support. The, uh, the, uh, these include in the middle, that gold, uh, uh, models that support comprehensive care with accountability for what really matters to people and populations, health outcomes, equity, experience, and lower costs. Uh, those primary care, advanced primary care, and, and population-focused models can be augmented by another set of models around the specialized care that accounts for most of healthcare spending, especially when people have important needs where uh, particular kinds of care, sometimes intensive, sometimes uh, really innovative drugs or otherwise can make a big difference, but often that are not well coordinated or used efficiently and effectively as part of a comprehensive uh, person-centered care experience. In addition, there are components of fee-for-service medicine that are not well designed to fit in with that. Uh, think about uh, ambulance payments and CMS that mainly uh, pay an ambulance for taking a person to a hospital when there's an emergency call, not uh, supporting them and getting that patient to the right setting of care, treating them right there at home, uh, if that's the most important thing to do. And then finally, most payments in our healthcare system are still fee-for-service based. Uh, so moving away from that, supporting the transition into uh, comprehensive care uh, is also critical to get to the better outcomes, the lower costs, the goals on the left-hand side of the slide. And if you think about what CMMI and other programs have been doing on the federal, the state level, and the private sector, there certainly are components related to this. So you go to the next slide, you see, uh, um, for example, in the model supporting comprehensive care, uh, primary care first models, accountable care organizations, the Medicare shared savings program, uh, and the new direct contracting models. Uh, but they're not yet viewed as a, a comprehensive and coherent set of supports. You're getting back to that core theme of a uh, uh, long-term uh, clear path forward. Similarly, a lot of models around episode-based care that aren't yet fully interfacing with stronger primary care, and a lot of efforts to make fee-for-service work better uh, that could be part of an overall strategy like this. 
And onto the next slide, uh, we just wanna emphasize again that while we think CMMI has a critical role to play in leading these efforts, there are other parts of uh, the federal government, CMS and other agencies, as well as other stakeholders that are also very interested in these same goals. Uh, many private payers are implementing similar kinds of person-focused comprehensive uh, care reforms. States, uh, as we'll hear about, are implementing similar kinds of models and employers such as through the Purchasers Business Group on Health, been working closely with us on these efforts, uh, are taking multi-stakeholder efforts to move in the same direction as well. Uh, so we're going to talk in our two panels about steps to facilitate care transformation, some of which are discussed in our report around this kind of coherent uh, uh, set of models and how they could fit together and how the public and private sectors can work together to, to implement them, uh, and also how they can fit with more specialized care models. And then our second panel, we're going to talk about achieving health equity goals in this framework, where it's very important to remember that many vulnerable um, individuals and many uh, underserved uh, populations get their care from different providers that rely heavily on Medicaid or federal payments through uh, community health centers. So very important to include those components in a reform effort. And finally, as I showed on that earlier slide, system-wide supports uh, that make it easier to go beyond traditional health care, for example, connecting health care providers to community-based services and social services that can help address the drivers of poor health that come from outside the healthcare population outside of healthcare, uh, such as through food insecurity or housing insecurity. They're so important, especially for underserved populations that have contributed to our health equity gaps. Uh, there are lots of steps underway to create a better infrastructure to support those efforts. So we're going to try to cover all of those issues uh, today. Um, and let me go right now to, to talking about uh, the person who's really on the, the at the front of uh, leading these kinds of efforts on reform. Uh, 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 Dr. Liz Fowler, who's the uh, director of the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. Liz, thank you so much for being with us today. We really appreciate all the work that you've already been undertaking related to a vision and strategy for the future uh, of value-based payment and the, and, and the motivations for it. Um, could you maybe start off by talking a little about how your thinking is going around implementing a strategic plan for CMMI and your priorities for the next few years? Sure, and thanks for the introduction, Mark, and thanks for the opportunity to be here. I'm really fortunate to have the opportunity to be uh, the CMS Innovation Center Director uh, with such an excellent excellent team and excellent leadership under our new administrator, Chiquita brooks Lashure. In my mind, we have an excellent team, a critical mission combined with our 10-year milestone to give us a retrospective and a spate of recommendations for where we should go next including your report, thank you very much. So it's a really exciting time to be here. Um, our priorities over the next two or three years are really gonna be laser focused on the twin challenges and opportunities we faced, accelerating the shift to value and advancing health equity, just exactly as you've explained it. And as part of the strategic exercise that you've mentioned, we spend a lot of time looking at the lessons from the last 10 years, talking with as many thought leaders like yourself and others um, who are part of this event today, about their vision for the future. And there is actually a remarkable degree of consensus um, and our vision will require us to bring high quality value-based person-centered care to every community in America. So we are looking at that person-centered vision that you outlined and we are going to spend a lot of time thinking about how our models can reach, um, for example, our primary care models can reach rural communities as well as racial and ethnic minorities. Um, to make sure that the benefits of uh, value-based care expand to all populations. Thanks, and, and in terms of uh, achieving those very broad goals, um, and any more details you wanna share about uh, what you're prioritizing first and how you're, how you're thinking about tracking progress to the goals? Progress, tracking progress on the goals is a good question and we're still working on that. I think, um, let me first start by saying that um, we are converging on this vision of, health, uh, of a health system where the patient is at the center um, and focusing on um, payments and providers um, that, that really focus um, um, on people and the care that people receive. It's that, what are we doing this for um, that you talked about in your opening remarks? 
In our mind, it means that every Medicare and Medicaid beneficiary is in a care relationship that includes meaningful accountability for quality and total cost of care, whether that's an ACO, advanced primary care practice, direct contracting, or managed care entity. Um, we're looking at um, figuring out how do you measure that and, and can we get to you know, X percent um, by the end of 2030, for, for example. And I think we're still sorting out those actual metrics. Um, we're looking at um, quality measures to make sure that those align with the goals that matter to patients and patients' values. Um, we're also looking at more um, care that is um, meeting people and patients where they are, delivering care in homes and communities. Um, most likely, it also means more virtual care um, and making sure that people are really at the center of the health system. Um, and we're also looking at aligning payers across the system to facilitate transformation. And so at a minimum um, that these payments are aligned in Medicare and Medicaid to focus on improved health and again, on more equitable outcomes. Um, so again, we're thinking about how to track our progress, maybe check back in a couple of months and we'll have a little bit more clarity on that. It's a good question and one we're still working on. Well, answering. one that you're clearly thinking about, and you mentioned alignment across payers, and we do have multiple payers in the U.S. healthcare system, some of them public states, uh, uh, for example, and some many of them private, uh, commercial, employer-backed plan, plans, uh, exchange plans. Um, any thoughts on um, how that, um, that, that alignment can, can best go forward at this point? Another good question mark, of course. And I, you know, I think we're trying to think more broadly about how we define and measure um, multi-payer alignment um, rather than have payers um, join our models um, which some, or states, which can sometimes be complex. Um, they don't align with the timeframes. We're really looking at it more broadly. Can we get um, everybody sort of moving in the same direction? If we believe that this patient-centered uh, or people-centered vision is important, and what that entails, and we can define that clearly. Can we get everybody else to define that clearly? Other payers, other states, Medicaid agencies. Um, and so I think trying to make sure that the direction we're heading represents a consensus and bringing others along with us. Um, in some cases, what we've found is we've had these conversations with other payers, they're way ahead of us. Um, they're already thinking about this. In fact, they've moved on. But then we also hear, you know, for example, primary care first, some payers aren't ready to join us because it's too advanced for them. It's further than they are. So I think we're trying to take into consideration um, some of those dynamics. And it's the same on the provider side. Some providers are much further ahead. Some are, you know, a little reluctant to jump in. And we're trying to meet meet um, meet them where we are and push everyone forward. And it does seem like in our discussions with uh, many of those uh, groups around the country, in terms of common ground, one area of common ground, as you mentioned, is strong primary care, you know, not necessarily the way people have thought of primary care in the past, but advanced practices that are digitally enabled, that, that can reach people at home using virtual care, and they can help coordinate the care that they get with uh, uh, the rest of the healthcare system, specialists and others. Are, are, are you finding uh, primary care to be a, a key part of this effort? Absolutely. And as I come from a long line of primary care providers in my own family, and I'm really heartened to see uh, this renewed interest in advanced primary care and really doubling down on the role that primary care can play in a high-performing health system. Um, recent recommendations have highlighted this opportunity, including uh, your own and also the report by the National Academy of Medicine. Um, comprehensive primary care models are really one of the key priorities that CMMI will be focusing on in the short term. Um, we have a lot of experience with primary care models. We started testing comprehensive primary care models back in 2012 with the four-year multi-payer demonstration and nearly 500 participating primary care practices. The results were mixed, but we did learn a lot from that model. A subsequent model, the Comprehensive Primary Care Plus, CPC Plus, launched in 2017 with the lessons learned from the first iteration, and we had over 2,600 practices participating. Primary Care First model is the one that's just getting started, and again, building on that experience um, that we learned from CPC Plus. So, um, the model is based on a lot of principles that are described in your report. So taking what we've learned over the years, we're going to continue to work on the models. Um, we are looking at this direct contracting model that allows participants to enter into a capitated payment arrangement, including for primary care services. 
And we need to move towards advanced primary care with ideally accountability for total cost of care, recognizing we're on a trajectory and not everyone is ready. But if we really want to coordinate chronic care, um, coordinate care for chronically ill and seriously Ill, Ill patients who aren't in Medicare Advantage or aren't getting that um, care elsewhere, uh, we need to get primary care right. Yeah, and you mentioned that um, while this is this is at the center of the, the the work that you're doing, there also are a lot of primary care practices that said, "Hey, we're we're not ready, and we're coming off a pandemic where we saw our revenues fall." And and by the way, I'd add that. From the data we're seeing, not all of the kind of prevention-oriented primary care that's so important in a, a person-centered healthcare system, a lot, all, of, all of that hasn't even uh, come back to the levels that, that, that um, existed pre-pandemic. So I think many of them are feeling, as you said, like they're struggling. You know, how do they get up to the level of practice that would enable them to succeed in an advanced model like primary care first? Now, I know many of the CMS CMMI programs that you described have a had a transition path built in. There have been some successful models. Um, that the ACO investment model we highlighted in our work is one that was designed for small practices, gave them some upfront resources to help them get going. Uh, you mentioned uh, direct contracting, where I think at least part of the goal was to enable primary care practices to partner with organizations with expertise, maybe with capital that could help back them and, and you know, develop those capabilities. But that model, uh, you all pause temporarily or, or thinking about modifying. Um, can you say a little bit more about how to help? Or maybe it's a, it's a range of approaches that could help the primary care practices uh, get up to the level of, of uh, succeeding in these kinds of comprehensive care approaches that you've outlined. You, you cut out just as you were asking the question. You said, okay. can you say a little bit more? And then I'm not sure if it was my um, my, my system. Yeah, I mean, well, well apologies. That. You know, we're still in the, um, hopefully the later phases of the Zoom era. But um, the, um, uh, the question was really about how to help the primary care practices that say they're struggling and getting there and that, that there are a number of um, opportunities that CMMI has put forward. Uh, um, I mentioned the ACO investment right. model is one that's helped kind of smaller rural practices and had some good uh, evaluation evidence. Direct contracting was intended to, I think, in part, bring in some help from other organizations and some capital to uh, augment the, the primary care practice capabilities, but that model's on pause. So um, uh, how do you see any early thoughts on how these uh, approaches can fit together to help fill that gap that, the, uh, that many of the primary care practices are worried about in terms of being able to get up to uh, the capabilities needed to succeed here through either new funding or partnerships or maybe other approaches? Well, you mentioned AIM, which was a really important model, and, and we have a follow-on to that as well called the chart model that's looking at giving some of that investment. And you mentioned direct contracting. We're looking at um, options for that um, program as well. We have um, a number of um, entities in the field now. We have more coming online in 2022 and thinking about um, the future of that model as well. Um, I think it will become more clear at the point when we're ready to sort of unroll or unveil um, what we're thinking about in terms of the strategy. I really want, I think it's important that all the pieces fit together and that we give a line of sight into what we're thinking. I think a real clear vision for where we're heading will help all stakeholders in the system, um, not just potential participants or participants or those who want to participate, but also um, other payers and other purchasers. Um, so, so, we are continuing to move ahead. You'll hear more from us, I think, um, as time goes on, hopefully in the near future. Um, but that investment um, and the making sure that the capital, um, the, the um, tools, the resources are needed that are needed to transform practices are available. Great, uh, thanks. Clearly I've been thinking a lot about it. And I did wanna um, end maybe, uh, uh, Liz, with some with the other big theme, very related, uh, uh, interrelated theme around equity that that you've emphasized, uh, uh, Administrator uh, Chiquita Brooks Lashur has, has emphasized, the entire administration has emphasized. You know, we're at such a, um, a a critical time now, coming off of these big disparities that emerged in COVID or that worsened in uh, uh, COVID amid the the past years' experiences around uh, uh, social justice and equity and in many other 
other areas. So it's not just the administration, but healthcare organizations across the country are uh, undertaking sort of unprecedented efforts to try to address this. Can you say a little bit more about how that fits into your thinking and, and maybe some things we should be looking for as, uh, uh, as CMMI tries to help lead uh, uh, the, the healthcare system in, in addressing equity issues as well? Sure, and thanks for that question. And, and as you say, health equity is a key priority across the Biden-Harris administration. We're taking our cues from the very top, um, from the White House, Secretary Becerra, and on down. And at CMMI, let me first say, we're bullish on addressing health disparities and promoting health equity, um, and think that these factors can play a significant role in a person's health. Um, CMMI has tested a model aimed at social determinants of health, the Accountable Health Communities model, um, we are, we've learned a lot from those concepts and we think they can be incorporated more broadly. Um, some of the advice and recommendations given to CMS and CMMI about how to advance um, health equity and payment model design are relevant to other stakeholders in the system. We're looking at um, which providers um, are part of our network or our practice or system and the patients that they serve. We're gonna be able to, I think, give us a clearer picture of how much we're reaching across um, different communities and making sure we're um, pulling up those underserved areas as well. Um, looking at the types of insurance um, that are that the patients um, who are part of those models um, um, carry and how their access to services um, are being met and their health needs. Uh, we're looking at the services that are covered and paid for. And we're also engaging, um, trying to engage more with um, community-based organizations and thinking about how to do that. Um, so I think it's a really unique opportunity. We really need to build on this momentum. But let me also say, I wanna emphasize, we should try to do that with some uniformity across the health system so we don't end up like um, quality of care where everyone's measuring it slightly differently and um, quality is reported slightly differently. And um, I think it muddles the picture a bit. Um, if every health plan or provider or payer collects da different data or defines race and ethnicity differently. I think we risk undermining the credibility of the case that we're making and the changes that need to happen. So I'm hopeful we can keep this momentum going and that advancing health equity takes off as a national priority and shared goal, as I think it is. Um, and CMMI can be at the forefront um, of that um, movement. Yeah, it, does, it does seem like uh, CMMI action there is critical. You mentioned uh, getting, say, alignment on how we're tracking progress on, on these key goals. Um, CMMI has led the way in some of the measures of payment reform already, the, you know, the so-called LAN, the, the Learning and Action Networks payment categories, which so far have not focused on, on equity issues, I would, I would add have been widely adopted across states and, and other places. Uh, do you see CMMI taking on a uh, more of an active role there in extending um, this effort to, to get to alignment behind uh, effective action on equity? I hope so. And, and you know, you're, you're part of the Learning and Action Network leadership. And I think we're really hoping to use that as a tool to, um, to help ignite um, this sort of national sense of, of urgency to address this issue. And, and the LAN is looking very closely at that with an action team um, focused on health equity. So um, I, I think we're um, also thinking about CMS's role. And, and, and look, we need to, in addition to coordinating across payers, we need to be coordinated across CMS as well. We can't be, CMMI can't do something different than the you know, Medicaid folks are doing or that Medicare is doing or that the quality folks are doing. So there's an effort within the agency to make sure that we're all aligned as well. Um, so CMS is a catalyst and a leader and really no other payer comes close to the influence wielded by our agency and, and that we take that responsibility seriously. And um, so we're looking at that and making sure that we're coordinated and aligned as well. Well, I appreciate that. There are uh, so many opportunities, say, in the, the Medicaid oversight that CMS provides, uh, some of the waivers already approved. You know, you talk about more flexibility in payment to address the social drivers of health or some models to build on there and a lot of infrastructure or other support payments that are going out to states right now uh, in 
part to help with COVID response, but since these are some of the key areas where we've had real challenges with COVID, it uh, seems like some uh, important opportunities for alignment across CMS. Uh, but Liz, there are other federal agencies, mainly within HHS, that also have a critical role here. Uh, HRSA, which provides the primary funding to the community health centers, uh, other programs that also uh, support um, social services and it could be better integrated. Do you see your efforts um, extending as part of this administration? priority uh, beyond CMS? Oh, absolutely. As I mentioned, this is a key priority for Secretary Becerra, and the Secretary's office is making sure that all of the agencies underneath HHS are all speaking together and speaking with one voice. So in addition to this alignment across CMS, I think there are efforts um, with ASPE, with HRSA, as you mentioned, um, and others that have a, have a role and a stake in this issue. Well, Liz, I want to thank you for joining us today. Uh, you've clearly got a lot to do. I hope we're able to have you back at a future uh, Duke Margolis event and, and hear about uh, more progress on all of these issues. But uh, thank you for being with us today, and especially thank you for taking on such a, a broad and critical and timely agenda for uh, improving our healthcare system and, and getting to high value comprehensive care. Thanks. And thanks for your report. I thought it was really well done and look forward to learning more from the rest of the panelists. Great. Well, well, more to come. So, so take care. And now I'd like to turn straight to our first panel. Uh, as Liz just uh, mentioned, we're going to hear from a range of experts on how value-based payment can help bring about and sustain transformation in healthcare delivery. Hopefully a chance to build off, uh, build off of all of those uh, issues that, that Liz uh, just teed up. A very uh, active agenda, it sounds like, coming from CMMI and CMS and the administration around driving uh, transformation and care. So uh, to talk about this issue, we've got a panel that has deep experience in care transformation and how value-based payment can help support it, can help make the sustainable business case to enable these kinds of models to, to succeed and, and thrive. Uh, we're joined by Don Crane, the president and CEO of America's Physician Groups, which includes a range of uh, physician-led organizations that are already uh, doing this kind of uh, uh, model with uh, big shifts away from, from fee-for-service. Mara McDermott, who's Vice President at McDermott Consulting, has been working with and providing expert guidance for a number of organizations that are moving down this path, some of whom are uh, already at a pretty uh, advanced stage of, of payment reform and care delivery. Uh, and Don Berwick, President Emeritus and Senior Fellow at the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, a former CMS uh, administrator who, through his career, has been focusing on efforts around uh, care transformation quality improvement uh, and equity. So really pleased to be joined uh, with this group. We're gonna start off with asking each of them to spend a few minutes on the kinds of care transformations that they think we need to see in the next few years and the best opportunities given where we are now, what we know, uh, what we've just heard from the administration, some of the best opportunities for advancing these efforts, like through uh, more comprehensive uh, primary care uh, and some of the steps that CMMI can take to address that. And if they're up for it, uh, some of the steps that the organizations they work with could, could take to address it as well. So we're gonna hear for a few minutes from each of them, then we're gonna head into some uh, follow-up discussion. If you all have any who are joining us today, have any questions, topics, points that you'd like to raise, please send this, uh, them in to us using the, the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom screen. We're going to get to as many of those as possible, too. Uh, but let me begin by turning to, to Don Crane. Don, thanks for being with us today. Well, thank you very much for inviting me, Mark. This is a, a, an excellent opportunity, and I'm honored to be with this esteemed panel to join in this conversation. So let me jump right into it. I, I, I um, think that a comment Liz has made here again, I think, but certainly in some other conversations about the value movement being at a crossroads is entirely correct. Um, we're 10 or 11 years since the enactment of the ACA, uh, five or six years since the enactment of MACRA. Um, we've got a lot of results, but we've got a lot of work to do. So crossroads is probably an apt metaphor. The only two things I would add to it are that the stakes are so high in my opinion, um, that I believe that around us, as we turn left, right, or go straight, there is an abyss. Um, in other words, the, we really need to get this right. And the other point I would make is that we should talk a little bit about pace. We need to, I think, move 
very, very much faster than we currently are. And that isn't just because, at least in my case, uh, that we're impatient. It is also really that there's a kind of a gun to our head. Now that sounds melodramatic and it may be a different kind of gun for different people. Um, for many providers, the gun is the potential of sequesters and pay cuts and rationing and the like to bring healthcare into some sort of semblance of affordability. Uh, for others, the gun might be the prospect or fear of a single payer system, whether good or bad for them, that's a gun. For me, and I think many others, the other gun is basically just the sort of immorality of uh, our society allowing really avoidable illness and suffering to continue. We're better than that. We know better than that. Uh, we seem to be um, not satisfied with it, but we're complacent about it. So those are the guns that I think caught, that caused me to think that we need to really double down on the pace of the value movement, basically. So as I talk a bit about value movement, just a few words in the way of level setting, what are the elements that I have in mind? So at the center of value here um, are organized groups. Now they might be IPAs, they may be ACOs, they may be staff model medical groups. Uh, they can be other variations on those themes, but at their heart, there's a centrality to them all, a centrality of support. So databases, analytics, care managers, all of the supportive functionality that goes with the delivery of comprehensive care and better care. So it is certainly not a disorganized cacophony of independent physicians, which has been our history. So very important that there is organization and systems that are a part of what we, we envision. The next thing that I think we need in terms of the elements um, is, is prospective payment coupled with quality measurement. So prospective payment, whether it's capitation, whether it's some sort of better budget-based model needs to be in place to align the incentives of all of those within the enterprise. So whether it's an ACO or uh, an IPA, so that all the players, nurses, physicians, administrators are all in pursuit of the same goal really and that goal is a healthier population, right? It's to keep the population healthy in contrast to a fee-for-service model, which happens to reward providers for seeing sick patients. And so the emphasis is not on sickness, it is on health. And that of course is the great virtue really of prospective population-based payments. So that's a critical uh, uh, indicator. Uh, the other thing that I will quickly say is that there needs to be a quality measurement program. So uh, oh, I think we all have dabbled in behavioral economics in a way as we've looked at different payment models. There's no question that the payment of prospective money, and we've saw, seen this in our history, could, were it not for quality measurement programs, call them paper performance, stars programs and the like, uh, it result in the stinting of care. So when you marry up the uh, prospective payment with a quality program by which we measure important me metrics, manage, and then constantly improve and have create a learning system, then you basically have, I think, you know, the, the vision that I think many of us see for the really more perfect system um, that, that the nation deserves. Um, final element, and that is primary care. So in our group that Mark, to which you referred earlier, we've talked a lot about the um, importance of primary care. And indeed the model that I think we at APG envision is entirely primary care centric. And there's a couple of really good reasons for that. And first of which is thinking supply and demand now, that's the health status of the nation. That is the demand. So 90% of the spend in Medicare is for seniors with multiple chronic diseases. That is where the problems lie. We need a system designed for those problems and not the problems of old. So um, primary care is well suited for that, not exclusively the domain of primary care. But when you think about CHF and uh, hypertension and the other major chronic diseases, those are all uh, predominantly handled by primary care physicians. And so that's the specialty, especially if I may use the term that's best suited for this population and this health status. The other thing about primary care is it's enormously cost effective. 
So though I don't have the precise statistic in front of me, for every dollar spent on primary care, you get a large multiple order of magnitudes larger in terms of savings. So bang for buck, it's the best way to deal with these chronic illnesses. So when you take it together, that is why, why the organized systems that, uh, that we envision um, are so uh, primary care centric. Um, Mark, you asked us to, I think, to talk a little bit about some of the lessons that we've learned over the course of the last few years. And they, are, they have been many. Um, one thing I would say is we've learned from our CMMI pilots, right? Some 53 of them, I think, but the learnings haven't been limited to that narrow um, set of, of, of experience. We've got learnings going on across the country in different programs and different models. There's California done it for a long time elsewhere. And so the collective wisdom that has been derived from that experience is important and should I think be harnessed as we, as we go forward. And I think maybe the central most point that has been learned is that we can't get to where we want without changing the payment model. Now, it isn't the only thing to be done and it isn't itself a per se, a panacea, but the other model fee for service is itself a barrier to all of the in innovation and the kind of improvements we want. So I think sort of the overarching lesson number one is that, you know, care and proving care is inextricably linked to payment model, you know, whether we like it or not, <laughs> because it's very hard to change payment models. It is unfortunately our lot, everyone, that we've got to do it. Yeah. Um, so that would be the overarching lesson that I would point to. Um, some specific lessons out of the, the, the various APMs. A fee-for-service platform, which we currently have in the Medicare ACO program, that platform is too strong an incentive, and the fee-for-service embedded there prevents that model from succeeding as well as we would like. Um, we've got to it at a minimum capitate primary care and should probably be subcapitating other specialties as well. So there's an important lesson out of um, the various um, pilots and demos. Next, open network is a problem. Now we may have to live with it in some fashion in original Medicare, no question. But to the extent that we can move to voluntary assi assignment and alignment in order to get the kind of engagement, patient engagement that we need, then we must do that. Um, I think, you know, the greatest hope, and Don Burr will probably quickly agree with this, I would hope, you know, the vision of most physicians is in a patient that's engaged and informed and good things happen. And that happens, you know, when they know they're within uh, an ACO or within an APM. And so that is important. Um, next, benchmark dilemmas, and there are many, you know, we know that historical spend is pretty much self-extinguishing. We'll see that more in the coming years, I think, in the ACO program as ratcheting ever downward by improving and in decreasing cost, all of a sudden, you know, the ACO itself has no opportunity to make a profit and so on. That's a problem. The other side of that coin, of course, is regional benchmarks. If left, a, a, if left alone, will penalize, you know, a low benchmark will penalize the really efficient performers. And so we're missing out on having some very important organizations within these programs. So some sort of a blend yeah. Um, seems to make sense. So to wrap up, I have limited time. I can see your head nodding. What do we do? <laughs> a lot of good uh, issues, but uh, yeah, we do need to, to, to keep moving. <laughs> Should I mean, you want, if you, I'll, I'll stop if you want me to, I think. Okay. Well, I think we'll come back to some of these topics. Okay. How can we make this all go faster? Uh, how do we get Fair patients enough. more engaged and comfortable with not just feeling like they need to have a completely open network that seems like a sign of lack of confidence, uh, uh, yeah. really? And how can we, uh, um, what's the role of mandatory shifts here, which, uh, as you said, uh, would help get at some of these benchmark issues? So lots of good stuff to discuss there. Um, let me turn now to uh, Mara McDermott for a uh, few opening thoughts and then hopefully a, a little bit of time for further discussion too. Sure, thank you. Thanks for having me, Mark, and thanks for letting me participate in the paper. It was a really fun group to work with. I will uh, be brief in my opening remarks. 
um, you know, in terms of thinking about the future, I, I think that COVID-19, as you all know, has really laid bare the challenges of a fee-for-service reimbursement system. And what we have seen with our clients who were on the value journey, wherever they were in that journey, they were better positioned to handle the challenges of a global pandemic and day-to-day -day challenges. And we saw a lot of really rapid coordinated response to the pandemic that I think um, went well beyond sort of making do. They were able to innovate. They had the data, they had the infrastructure, they had the bodies, care managers, other extenders who were able to go to people's houses and deliver meals or identify patients who maybe needed somebody sent to their home to provide care. And we've heard those stories and I find them and I, I know both um, Don Berwick and Don Crane do too, so inspiring and really the reason for this work and the reason that we need to put that foot on the gas and continue to move forward. So I am um, really excited about that. I think the challenge for CMMI right now specifically is that coming out of the pandemic, there are a large number of differing provider organizations, whether that's in kidney care or oncology care. And I, I think I saw a question in the box earlier about this. Um, ACO direct contracting who are hungry to dive into these models. And I fully understand the pause and the reason the need to reassess, but I worry a little bit that we're gonna miss this opportunity where we have a very fired up and engaged set of providers who wanna jump into the value movement who maybe don't have an application open for them to do it. So I'm, I'm mindful of that. Um, I think there are a lot of lessons from prior CMMI models. It sounds like we're gonna jump into some of that more later in terms of attribution and benchmarking as Don mentioned and spreading innovation and how we measure success, right? Is that only a cost number or do we pay attention to some of these things like organizing communities and putting in place infrastructure, the use of waivers and other things and, and sort of like how that movement is going on the ground. And then Mark, I know you assigned us three specific recommendations for CMMI. So I will tell you my three. Um, I think the first one is a broader engagement with CMMI and and I, to do that, I think there are some specific things. I've long thought that CMMI, especially as we move into capitated models, needs to do more stakeholder engagement on the models before they become the model, right? So something like the Medicare Advantage Rate Notice or Medicaid Director Letters, where you kind of see what the parameters of that capitation or value-based care payment are gonna be, receive stakeholder input, and then put out the final 45-day notice. I'm not suggesting notice and comment rulemaking. I don't wanna get hate emails after this, <laughs> some greater engagement, I think with stakeholders as we move to higher levels of risk and reward. Um, the second one is, I think there's a real opportunity to accelerate innovation identified through the COVID-19 pandemic. The one that is top of mind for me is acute hospital care in the home. I know CMMI has been, you know, I think thinking about that and working with providers on that. And it's just one example but there are a lot of really intriguing, interesting innovations that came to fruition because of COVID-19. I think it's a great opportunity for the agency to, to explore its portfolio and think about some of those. And the final one is a very specific one, which is I think we have to reopen an advanced ACO or direct contracting, whatever name you wanna use, option for providers who have been on that journey. And we have to do that as fast as possible. Um, I think there's a lot of hunger out there. There can be improvements made, but you know, sort of a 2023 performance period, I think is pretty important. So I'll stop there and let, let Don Berwick have a turn. Yeah, thanks, Mar. Some, some great comments. I, I appreciate the, the uh, specificity too. It, you know, it is hard for more organizations to see a pathway into this kind of advanced primary care, comprehensive care without clear models open and since how they fit together. I did get the impression from Liz both today and in prior comments that, that, that CMMI is really trying to take to heart the uh, feedback they're getting from you, from others in, in uh, trying to do that, um, um, but uh, certainly helpful to, to put those constructive ways to address that issue off, off front and center. Um, Don, uh, thanks for joining, Don Berwick, uh, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Mark, can you hear me okay? Just fine. Okay, uh, I, I don't, I break the rules of my screen share, I wanna show a couple quick things that'll go. Okay. Um, I, uh, first of all, I just wanna say how thrilled I was to listen to Liz. I mean, maybe we should just, we should just stop and let Liz keep going, I think. But, uh, <laughs> I, it, it, she's got it all right. Um, so so I, I'm, I'm gonna, try to be really brief. So conceptually, I come from a very strong position, which is that the payment system cannot, it can't drive change 
without the real mindfulness of the new system we want. And I, I can't say that often enough that we, if we don't, if we aren't clear as a community of leaders and CMMI and all of HHS about the system we want to birth, we can't get the payment right because the test of payment change is whether the system is birthed. Uh, the, this is the, 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 the uh, diagram that I've used for you know, 10, 15 years saying that the, 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 the experience of the patient and community pulls change in the microsystems that give care, which ought to pull organizational change in the environment exists as a facilitator to that. The boss is the patient experience, not the payment system. Payment systems need to, needs to be responsive. When I ran CMS, I tried to tattoo the triple aim on everybody. I thought we, we're here for, for these, these changes, better experience of care for individuals, better population health and lower per capita cost. I personally think that we need to keep that set of goals absolutely on the, on the wall in front of us all the time, because otherwise we, get, we run payment with doctrine and that's not a good idea. Um, the aim set that would reflect that kind of um, achievement is, is long. Liz, Liz said a lot. This, this is the kind of thing that's on my mind, and it is reflected in the paper mark that you so brilliantly led us to produce. We've got to get to universality. There should be continuous cost reduction, not slowing the rate of rise. We should aim, I think, for 15% of GDP as the healthcare goal. And, and any, any change that doesn't put us on that trajectory, I, I don't think is, 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 it doesn't reflect the best of us. Waste needs to go. The ideal MLR is 100%. And, 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 and I think CMMI has a big role in sorting out and, and getting rid of waste as, as an ongoing um, goal of every change that it makes, focusing on what matters to patients and families. We've got to move, of course, to social determinants of health. I'm absolutely thrilled to hear Liz talk about agency-wide alignment, department-wide alignment, and I'd say all of government alignment on that, and shifting resource to the most vulnerable uh, around the equity frontier. Um, we need to make continuity over lifetimes, as Don Crane was talking about, and we can't have a demoralized workforce. There has to be attention to the effect of our changes on joy and work, uh, and it should be a learning system. And I think I agree completely with Mara that the reliance on hospitals is one of the biggest mistakes in design we have. Home is the hub, hospital, home, anything CMMI can do to advance the shift of the center of care to home and community is good. So you asked me for three things for CMMI, I've got, I don't know, 10. So let, let, me, let, me, <laughs> let me be a rebel. Um, first of all, I think using the triple aim and universality, it's a four goal metric that we need. So everything CMMI does should be focused on is care better for individuals, is the health of the population improving, is total cost falling, and is everyone in? And, and I would simplify metrics a lot around those as the primary um, assessments at almost every layer of activity of CMMI's work, CMS's work. I think we should move to global budgets as soon as possible, as fast as possible. I don't think we can get there. Like Don Crane said, it will not happen in a fee-for-service environment. I just don't believe it can. And so the more we get to funding organizations to give total care to populations, the better we can. That's a really slow going for many, but there are fast ones out there. So another advice to CMMI is allow the fast to go fastest. We need advanced tracks that are cutting the ground and, and, and never slowing an organization down that wants to move toward triple aim and global budget. I think the RAF is, 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 has got to go. I think we, the coding games are just seep, they're just bleeding money from the trust fund and from public uh, possibility. And we've got coding wrong. And I think there should be a major CMA effort on a revolutionizing coding. And I think it's possible to do that, but it's going to take some real guts. Transaction costs are uh, much too high. I said the MLR is, should be 100%. And so we need to have a, a, a waste reduction enterprise in the funding of healthcare that is getting transaction costs out of the system. And that includes reducing financial intermediation. MA is there. We have intermediaries in that part of, of, of um, the system. I do not think we should introduce MA on the traditional Medicare side. I think to call direct contracting direct when it's indirect, when we're actually introducing financers between the payer, CMS, and the providers is, I think it's, it's, not, it's not honest. Um, that said, we need intermediation around um, integrators of care flow. Primary care is important. Not all primary care units can do that without help. So helpers are welcome. If direct contracting comes to mean helpers on the, on the, on the um, 
the traditional Medicare side, that's, that's fine. But I think we're making a very big mistake to introduce financial transactions in the traditional Medicare side. I think impanelment is crucial. I'm totally on board the primary care uh, bandwagon here. That in the, every change we make should move us closer and closer to knowing to the, to the idea that everybody has a doctor and you know who the doctor is. And we know who the people are that are with that doctor, but not, not doctor, care provider. That's where the integrator role matters. At the federal level, this is all really hard. I, I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued at what we might do with some real courage supporting uh, big state level innovation. And so that's something I would lean in on. And then to, to build on Mara's last point, it, uh, uh, integrating delivery system voice all the way in CMMI is crucial. I, I, when I was there, I wanted to have fellows all over the country, 5,000 I wanted, CMMI fellows that are people embedded in organizations. I think you'd see MMI should second delivery system leaders, both clinical and non-clinical leaders into CMMI on one or two year rotations. We've got to increase, decrease the distance between CMMI and delivery systems so the changes are as smart as they possibly can be and the sensing is as instant as it could be. Um, I've got more, but I think I'll stop there, Mark. Thanks for letting me. Well, that, that is, uh, that's great, Don. And I really appreciate between the three of you uh, uh, both emphasizing the, the importance of the, the vision and uh, shared uh, support around the vision for where we'd like um, this comprehensive care, high value care to go and uh, getting down to the specifics of, of how to get there. Uh, so we also have gotten a lot of uh, questions in and I appreciate people have sent those in. I'm gonna try and uh, weave those in uh, uh, right now uh, by starting with a common theme that you all emphasize, and that's needing a faster path uh, into um, these alternative ways of paying for care that support uh, the kind of vision that Don and the rest of you have uh, uh, have articulated. And right now, as we pointed out, there isn't really that kind of advanced track. There's certainly not a, a clear pathway yet where uh, organizations that are just starting out can go. Um, maybe we could uh, briefly ask for comments uh, from each of you on this one. So maybe pick up with where Don left off and Don, I'll paraphrase, but uh, sounds like uh, one vision that you have or one way of getting to this vision is through a very advanced uh, ACO type track, something that's more completely away from fee for service where the next gen ACOs were headed, but it you know, wasn't quite fully set up yet. Uh, you also did allow though, as for, for some maybe smaller organizations that need uh, some assistance, uh, having partnership uh, kinds of approaches. Uh, some of those are, are private with uh, private, sometimes venture backed entities that are providing a lot of capabilities for smaller practices, some of them public. There are some uh, uh, um, uh, community health centers that are sort of banding together and investing, you know, trying to develop capital to support uh, these kinds of efforts. So let me go back to Don uh, first, then Mara, and then and maybe uh, back to Don Prain first, then Mara, and then back to Don Berwick. Uh, on just uh, quick thoughts, you all both touched on, uh, or all three of you touched on this, but but how do we move faster in a way that's going to get enough consensus between administration, private sector, Democrats, Republican, to, to really make this speed stick? Don Crane. So I think we're dead in the water right now with the direct contracted model of uh, professional risk and global risk having been shelved for some undetermined period of time, if shelved at all. We don't know where we stand on that. I mean, it makes every bit of sense for CMMI to be evaluating all of the models very carefully. But one of the unfortunate consequences is that we allowed only the first cohort in and everybody else is wondering what's going on and people are interpreting it as, ah, the Biden administration has taken their foot off the gas. So the first quick thing to do would be to reopen that web portal and allow that second cohort to go forward, Mark. Okay, and then Mara, um, I know you've had some discussions about this too. Uh, for those of you who are interested in the topic, uh, if you go to our website, we've got um, some uh, 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 different perspectives on the, the pros and cons of uh, alternative approaches to uh, dealing with the goal of direct contracting and some of the concerns as well. Uh, Mara, uh, what do you see as a path forward here? Yeah, I wanted to just quickly come back to something Don Berwick said about the participants in direct contracting. I just wanna be really clear that there are now ACOs that are indirect contracting. They're you know, sort of pushing. There are more the ACOs since a lot of the next yeah. gen ACOs have moved there. Yeah. yeah. So just, you know, like one, one quick point on that. Um, I, you know, I think 
We need to create options. I will just quickly also say that, you know, I think we're a little bit frustrated on the outside and Mark, you, you and Don Burke know this better than, than I, but it seems like clearance process is a real barrier. Like these, you know, to, we want to have changes and we want to reopen the application process. And is that now going to be like a two year political event? Um, I think that's a little bit unfortunate. I do think that there's a lot of alignment to your point um, on this call, but also across political parties and people interested in value, you know, this stuff traditionally has not been partisan and, and divided. And I think there's a ton of common ground and um, alignment around primary care at the center, greater levels of risk and moving to prepayment, investment and expansion of these types of models. And I think we can get there together. Um, certainly getting some more applications open, I think, um, also continuing to evolve the Medicare shared savings program to higher levels of risk is another area of opportunity. Yeah, and this is an area where, to, to your point, there's Medicare Advantage, there are efforts in many state programs with their Medicaid managed care plans and many employers, uh, uh, including uh, Elizabeth Mitchell's work through PBGH, uh, similar kinds of, of goals to, to move into these models uh, faster and having it happen, as Liz mentioned, across the whole healthcare system can certainly help. But, but Don, can I go back and, and you know, on your point about sort of full risk provider organizations, okay, every I think everybody agrees that should be um, um, part of this, but I wanted to pick up on your point about how smaller organizations uh, can get to these sort of whole person, non-fee-for-service approaches without some kind of help and coordination. And there have been a couple of uh, questions in the in, in the chat, and you've seen them around, well, hey, doesn't, if, if it's uh, just uh, one option where the providers have to do this by themselves, essentially, isn't that going to lead to a lot more consolidation? Aren't there some other alternatives whereby small primary care practices working with partners, private or otherwise, uh, could, could get to this model too? Great question. Uh, so first, um, I, I have to pick up on the direct contracting. I'm glad it was stopped and it needs to be thoroughly redesigned. Although there are a lot of ACOs and direct contracting apps, if you look at where the covered lives are, the five or six insurers that got into the direct contracting mix, they covered the vast majority of those lives. This was not a play on making care different or better. It was a play on finance intervening itself and taking its share of the transactions between Medicare and the providers. I don't think that stands, that doesn't help. If they wanna do that, play Medicare Advantage. Don't introduce Medicare Advantage in traditional Medicare. That said, you're absolutely right. We, the, 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 the system is so fragmented that for, especially for small providers, there have to be a new set of supports, a new set of structures that actually help small providers that wanna get into global payment and risk bearing manage care. And that, so there's a technical support function there. It's not a finance support function. We have to generate some capital, I know that, but uh, I, I am complete, I think the redesign that's needed is to figure out how to have whatever we're gonna call it. I, I think direct contracting is not a very good way to name it, to create entities that can help practices reorganize around the total care of the patient, uh, global budgets and, and risk bearing. I think there are some, and I think we can birth them. And I think that some can be private sector. I just don't want the insurance industry interposing itself on the non-Medicare side of, uh, of this equation. That's not working on better care for individuals. That's working on transaction costs. That's so that opinion. does mean some other potentially other private sector partners that are backed by capital sources that could help bring in the resources needed here. As long as the capital sources, as you put it, are long sighted, I think that we don't need organizations to come in and flip with IPOs in two years. That's not just not it's just not the way to, to, change, to take what's essentially a public function, which is the provision of health care. And make it and make it thrive. So we got to be very careful and textured about this. And and Don, one of the you mentioned one of the reasons you have that concern is uh, the, all this attention that you mentioned around uh, RAF. So for people who aren't playing the inside baseball, that's, that's uh, putting a lot of effort into documenting what. Uh, complicating conditions or other factors, individuals in uh, one of these uh, MA Medicare Advantage plans or in one of these alternative payment models uh, have. And that matters because, you know, since we're not paying on the basis
pays the fee for service. Um, the the idea is to pay more to the plant to the to the um, uh, providers that that are attracting and keeping uh, the uh, the more complex patients. So you mentioned this would take a fundamental redesign. It does seem like this notion of risk adjustment, maybe even improved, you know, that better takes account of things like uh, um, uh, socioeconomic status, uh, race, and, and ethnicity issues. Uh, may even be more important to get these models right. So uh, you, you want to say uh, maybe Don Berwick start with you a little yeah, bit more I, about I, how to how to address that need in these kinds of models. Totally, you go back to the game. We want hospitals to want to be empty, and we want providers to want to take care of people that really needed them. And so to do that, we're going to have to have some form of adjustment and 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 able to support uh, home and community-based care at, at, in the delivery side. The adjustment, the, the RAF adjustment system is it's broken now. If you look at the IPO decks or the, or the SPAC decks of these organizations that want to take on direct contracting, they're selling upcoding that, that, it, it, quite publicly. You can, you, it, this isn't even private material. So they're, they're, they're and not the 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 uh, care management or other services like we were just talking about the longitudinal tracking things that go along with the uh, uh, the upcoding. <laughs> you bet. They're paying doctors to find more codes. That you, the uh, in the valuations and the IPOs, you're looking at at uh, valuations right now that are at thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars per covered life. It, it it's it, there's there's smoke. Believe me, there's. Fire. Hey, I'm, not, I'm not hearing the alternative yet, uh, Don. <laughs> Uh, let's. Uh, I think this is where CMMI can play. How, how could CMMI support the birthing of support systems, technical support systems that help mm-hmm. small practices, if, that, if that's where you want to focus, or medium-sized practices actually manage care uh, in, in, in with, uh, under global budget circumstances? We need technical support, not financial. Yeah. Now, Mara, you've worked with, and I get to you too, Don, uh, Don Crane, but Mara, you've worked with a number of organizations that include, you know, some of these partnerships, privately backed partnerships that um, I guess they're doing some of this uh, uh, careful documentation of, of, uh, uh, of, of comorbidities and risk factors. Uh, but are there ways to, to encourage an appropriate amount of attention to that. We want to pay right, uh, but make sure the focus stays on the actual steps and the investments in care improvement. Yeah, I mean, so I think it's something that we've been talking about for at least a decade, right? Is how do you get risk adjustment right? And we've tried different things and we haven't- Well, that is really important if we're moving far away from fee for service, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, so specific to direct contracting, I think there are some incentives built into the model that are not helpful, that could be revisited to Don Berwick's point. And I, there are other aspects of that model too, that I think could create at least a level playing field, perhaps address some of the concerns that Don Berwick has highlighted, highlighted to make it more like an advanced ACO for, you know, provider centric entities. I think that is totally possible. Um, this is certainly not my area of expertise, but it does seem like there's an opportunity for a working group to come together and really be thoughtful about risk adjustment in these models. And what are the things we wanna use the Innovation Center to test? And how do those tests work? And incorporating, I think, some of Liz's equity goals into that work as well. Great. So, and uh, Don Crane, I know, I know you got something to say. <laughs> well, the word is guardrails. So we should probably yeah. revisit the rules and have coding intensity caps. I think there already is one. So to the extent that there's an inappropriate upcoding, it r- runs into a ceiling. Where we find yeah. any improper upcoding, this is why we have penitentiaries. Just as we have upcoding in original Medicare with churning and unnecessary services and billings, for services that aren't rendered, those um, th- those those felons go to jail, and they should. Similar, similarly, in, in, in upcoding, but coding intensity cuts. I don't think you know we're going to have ASOs and we're going to have TPA supporting groups. They're going to need to exist now. Whether they're the prime contractor, and I guess there are a few, but very few in terms of number, or whether they're support organizations, individual physician groups often need MSOs, ASOs. TPAs to make this thing work. And so I think we shouldn't be surprised that there are not gonna be other players somehow clustered around the physician group, which is what we want. And so guardrails should be wisely designed to, I think, um, you know, keep out what we want out and let in what we want in to, 
So that was what I would say. And, and to Mara's point, we've had a, a decade of experience with this. And at, at this point, though, we're still in a, maybe a different guardrail and the Medicare Shared Savings Program versus direct contracting versus Medicare Advantage. So maybe a more unified approach there, too, if, that, if the focus really is on, on unifying these programs uh, uh, around comprehensive care and, and uh, to Don Berwick's point what we're really trying to accomplish with care here. Um, I know we don't have much time left. Uh, many more good questions came in, several related to how does specialized care and specialists uh, uh, fit into these models. Now, in that uh, report that that uh, you all helped provide some um, really good ideas and input for, uh, we do talk about how these primary care and comprehensive care models can be a, a base or a complement to models that enable specialists to be paid differently too, around the, uh, either the overall episode of care that they're providing, the, uh, the, the procedure, the, the, or, or the more chronic uh, assistance in managing a, a patient. Um, so you know, that, that's viewed as a, as a compliment here, but uh, wondering maybe uh, starting with Don Berwick, uh, thoughts about how to bring uh, specialists effectively into uh, this new kind of um, framework and this vision for, uh, for, for future healthcare. Um, ideally, weaning specialties as well as primary care away from fee for service. Uh, if we had specialty contracting at a population level, that helps. That helps a lot. Once you have a primary care group that has a global budget for care of a population, they become they can become with support very effective um, contractors, uh, commissioners uh, with the specialty units if they're strong at doing that. Um, for some specialties, I think. Uh, when we really need just regional supply at very high-end specialties, we may need some regional planning. I think this, could, this is where government can step in and say that we need to support certain centers of excellence to become suppliers of very high specialty services. But empowering the primary care uh, um, segment, I think, is one of the avenues to getting specialty care to be more helpful to global, global payment and population-based care. And that can complement and provide a partner to the, the centers of excellence, as you're saying. And, and if those centers of excellence can be paid on the best way to, to get outcomes in those specialized areas, which, as you're saying, is probably not yes. fee for service, yeah. uh, you can see a whole model coming together. Um, Mara, any, any thoughts to add on this, like, based on what you're seeing in terms of uh, best practices from some of these advanced uh, um, groups that may not cover all of the, the specialties themselves? Yeah, so I, I would add one like very technical specific recommendation, which is that as you know, you guys on the phone, but know this, there was a 5% incentive for participating in two-sided risk models included in MACRA. The way that that incentive has been implemented, implemented actually creates incentives for ACOs to remove specialists from their networks. I think that can be revisited and would have a very positive effect. And it's something that I think could be done pretty quickly and, and would help with this problem. The only other thing I would say is I think there's some really good um, progress that was made in the kidney care space and would love to see continued commitment to that direction as well around home, which Don Berwick mentioned earlier, and transplant and improving care for that population. Now, kidney care and patients uh, with, with frail multiple conditions uh, that might otherwise need an institution or hospital uh, otherwise uh, seem like good, uh, good places to really start getting this kind of approach into place. Um, uh, Don Crane? The, the best practice is subcapitation, but it won't happen overnight. So the second best practice is, Don Burke is right, a very empowered primary care. The, one of the both, that's how we bring specialty care in, and we need it, but it needs to be managed. So. And um, we only have a, a, a few minutes left. I, I would like to come back to one of the points that, that Don made and, and uh, Don Berwick made uh, from his uh, CMS experience. You know, to, to really pull this off, uh, it's not something that CMMI can do by itself. Uh, we've highlighted, and we're going to talk a lot in the next panel about a role for Medicaid programs and, and other parts of CMS that focus more on uh, states, uh, the role that they can play. But it also matters if we're talking about addressing, as so we'll focus on the next session, social drivers. Um, Don, you mentioned trying to implement some cross-cutting efforts when you were administrator. Uh, any quick high-level lessons from that experience that could be applied to achieve this goal? Yes. 
Um, I think Liz, Liz talked about it. When the sec at the secretarial level, the expectation is that agencies will play well with each other. Things really can change. We had amazing progress in projects between CM CMS and CDC, for example. Uh, I met regularly with Francis Collins talking about coordinating efforts between NIH and CMS. So I think you've got secretarial support for that and vision, I think it can happen. And you're absolutely right, this, this can, it can even happen only within CMS. I know Mark Smith has been talking eloquently about the need to think about, about what value-based purchasing means in the, in, for really vulnerable populations and, and stressed organizations. And you've got to get HRSA in the game. I think the VA matters, I think the Department of Labor and Agriculture can be helpful. So I, we need to think big about all of government coordination. Can it happen? Absolutely yes, as long as at the secretarial and maybe even the presidential level they're expecting it. And I think this administration may be up for that. Okay, and that's the public side. Uh, Mara and Don Crane, for the last words here, uh, as we emphasized in that report, as we've already talked about today, uh, it's not only the, the, the federal payers that are important in this effort and the federal programs, but also employers, uh, um, Medicare Advantage uh, plans, uh, state plans. You all both have a good deal of experience in working with uh, providers that are trying to um, get align models across uh, those different payers, which seems like a natural way to have more impact of these reforms. Uh, any quick thoughts about the most important opportunities for, for driving those public-private efforts forward? Uh, maybe, uh, Don Crane, I'll start with you. Well, it's a goal. I don't think I have a magic wand on it, Mark. Um, uh, programs out of the FCMMI would be helpful. Uh, statutes would be helpful requiring it. I, I think we need to be bold across the board on these things. I mean, I, I'm a believer in some mandates, but single quality measure set for, for every, all the programs, et cetera, et cetera. I think that the answer may lie in basically statutory mandates to, to uh, really enforce this uniformity across the system. Otherwise, we're, we're going to be inefficient forever. That's what I would say. And uh, I think, I'm not sure if Don uh, Berwick's experience was similar, but my experience with uh, imposing requirements through a, a federal program, especially if they extended elsewhere, was the more you support you had from outside stakeholders uh, behind that common approach, the, the easier it was to do. Uh, Mara, uh, last word for this? Yeah, you know, so I think uh, Don Crane and I both have some battle scars from trying, taking this effort on over many years. There, I, you know, I think it's about alignment of incentives too, and starting to think about, you know, how do you create incentives for the plans to to align to what Medicare is doing? Um, and I, you know, I think we could have some interesting conversations about what that looks like, whether that's changes to regulations or, you know, statutory or what. But I think there's a lot of opportunity there. And I think some of the groups that um, Don Crane and I both work with are are trying to initiate this on their own, right? They're trying to get their payers to come in line with what the Medicare models are doing with varying levels of success, but there are some success stories there that can be shared and built on. Yeah, I would say too, and this goes to Don Berwick's point about the vision being important. Uh, I'm uh, hearing a lot more from employers, from states, uh, from uh, uh, from many of the commercial plans and MA uh, about the shared interest in the kinds of directions that we've talked about today and the urgency for the reasons that that all three of you laid out in your opening comments, the, the rising costs, the concerns about equity in the sense that we just can't um, afford uh, on in many dimensions to continue at the pace we've been going. Well, I want to thank all of you for a great discussion on some very challenging topics uh, and uh, look forward to uh, continuing to work with, with all of you and to your continued leadership in, uh, in healthcare transformation towards uh, high value comprehensive care. Thank you very much for, for being part of this panel. Uh, and now we're going to turn to our wow. second panel and build right on uh, top of some of the thoughts and ideas that came out of the, the first one uh, um, about getting to uh, comprehensive care and doing it in a way that improves health equity, an area where if you look back at the past decade of payment reform, uh, there hasn't been that much intentionality, let alone consistent measurement or, uh, or uh, uh, explicitly uh, focused programs. Uh, that is really changing and building on some progress of the past years. And we're really pleased to have a, uh, a panel with us today uh, that can talk about some of the, uh, not just the attention that's been focused on health inequities in the context of COVID and the 
broader concerns about equity in society, and not just about the administration's perspective on this, but perspective of states, perspective of, uh, of uh, healthcare organizations uh, throughout the country uh, that are taking new steps in this dimension, uh, and that potentially reinforce the directions in, in value-based payment to achieve a, a vision of a, uh, of a high-performing uh, uh, comprehensive care-based uh, healthcare system. So uh, very pleased to have with us uh, Frederick Asasi, who's the Executive Director of Families USA. Uh, Mark Smith, alluded to in the last session, uh, Professor of Clinical Medicine at the University of California, San Francisco, and visiting professor at the University of California, Berkeley, and uh, Sue Birch, the Director of the Washington State Healthcare Authority, which oversees this kind of a kind of a multi-payer uh, uh, alignment effort there, overseeing uh, Medicaid and uh, state employee programs and leading some efforts that uh, extend much more broadly across payers in the state of Washington. Uh, and we want to start with asking uh, each of our panelists to spend a few minutes uh, sharing their thoughts on the topics that have come up today, uh, particularly around the role of value-based payment and getting to uh, a, a vision for healthcare that is comprehensive and that is much more equitable uh, than our system today. How CMMI's uh, steps may be complemented by steps across other payers can, can help get there. Uh, and uh, uh, maybe you can get into some of the, the goals and connecting the vision uh, to the specific steps uh, through uh, uh, a set of uh, early or, or, or most important actions. So uh, let me start by turning to, to Frederick. Frederick, if you're there, I think you may be on mute. Yeah, I'm on mute. I apologize. There you are. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you, Mark, very much. And it is really, it's an honor to be on this panel and to be part of this discussion. And you deserve an enormous amount of credit for bringing together um, such thoughtful conversations um, on this, on the topic of, of alternative payment models and the future of the country. So thank you, Mark. Um, you know, I think... I wanted to start by just saying that um, this question of the role of CMMI uh, in health equity, um, it's really quite a moment uh, to have that discussion. I think that we've all been pretty overwhelmed by what COVID has shown us. You know, we, I think for many folks who are, who are participating in this, we've all been believers for a while that fee-for-service economics, you know, not only are not incentive neutral, but lead to some pretty terrible quality of care, poor outcomes, and you know, a total, a, a very a, a high degree of waste. But I think it also has underscored for us that this current system, which is based on a fee-for-service chassis, has really left some of the most vulnerable people in this country um, far behind. And when stressors like COVID um, come to our shores, what we see is that those populations are, um, are left in terrible situations. So, um, I'd say that this is a really important topic and one that I hope CMI really, um, I think the signals are they're really gonna be running at um, as part of their mission. I think that um, there's two things I wanted to say really quickly about immediate actions that can be taken. Um, I think one of the things I wanted to say is in order for us to really address inequities in this country, we have to fully understand the problem and we don't, we simply don't. Um, and one of the, the simplest and most profound reforms that we could do pretty quickly is for the federal government, for CMMI, for HHS, for the president, and of course for Congress to come together and say, we've got to finally free healthcare data and ensure that all data, um, and in particular race and ethnicity are being collected and reported and are available ubiquitously to researchers and policymakers to really understand quality and cost, um, and of course, understand the problem of inequity. Second, I wanted to say that um, it's really important, it's the caveat, which is I've spent time in the alternative payment model uh, efforts in both Medicare and commercial, as well as in Medicaid and the state work um, with that's much more focused on vulnerable populations. And it's really important to say these are very different economics and they respond very differently. Um, and so the impact on health equity can be very different. And um, often in the commercial Medicare space, the realities of vulnerable populations things like unmet behavioral health needs, housing insecurity, food insecurity, justice involvement can make these populations very different and frankly incentivize pushing them out of a trivial populations and alternative payment models and actually make health inequities much worse. Um, and so it underscores how important it is that CMI is carefully examining 
uh, the way in which their payment models are being developed, the way they're risk adjusting. We've heard, I think, about that a bit. Um, and it's, it's critically important that CMMI have these data collected, reported, and monitored with strong risk adjustment so that we know what's going on with these vulnerable populations, both in reforms that are aimed at them, but also in the other reforms that are under, underway, that we know that they aren't getting pushed out um, out of patient census, that their outcomes are not are improving and not worsening. And I want to say that first because I think it's achievable. It's squarely within the authority of the federal government. And it really does have the potential for being a profound disruptive innovation that can unveil how expensive our system is, how it's failing our families, and in particular, um, our people of color, rural communities, and other underrepresented groups. Uh, beyond that, I want to say that, you know, at its heart, I think we've, you've heard, we've heard a lot from the other speakers about this, that what we're trying to do is move the goal of the US healthcare system past discrete units of care towards uh, health, right? That we're not done with our work until we're really delivering health to the American population. Um, and so accountability past units of care is really the key. You know, bundles and uh, value-based metrics and things like that are all stepping stones, but let's be honest, particularly around bundles, they reinforce some a lot of the fee-for-service games outside of the public payer patient population. So they can actually just, you know, kind of play right into the fee-for-service economics. Um, and so what I would say is the, the deeper, longer, profound reform, and we've, we heard about this from some of the other speakers, is that we're, CMMI is playing the pivotal role of moving APMs to invert current economic incentives. Um, and the most promising interventions that are, I think, addressing inequities really try, drive towards the integration uh, of overall health and social needs with the healthcare system. Best examples. I think are the accountable communities models, the CCO models that we see going on that bring together physical health, behavioral health, social services, corrections, other key players within the communities. They look at data, understand their community needs, set goals together around outcomes and uh, cost, and then they monitor that. Um, and this both refocuses the healthcare enterprise on, outcome, on the outcome of health, not just units of healthcare, but it also allows for the redistribution of resources from the overfinanced elements of physical health to those key social and behavioral health services that are central to the needs of people of color, rural, and other underserved communities. So I think that's the that's the from a health equity perspective, that's one of the most important long-term goals that we could um, set for ourselves. Within that, I just want to say a couple other things, which is, and there's a lot to say about this, but I won't go into detail too much. One, I would say. Um, we got to embrace the underlying economic realities that are at play. Um, we're talking about changing economic incentives and um, not simply a nod towards economic incentives and then um, expect folks to do the right thing. It doesn't work. And that means we really do have to understand, are we fully inverting the economic safety net ecosystems are responding to? Are we understanding the funding flows, payment triggers, financial vulnerabilities that can drive providers' willingness and hesitancy to participate in payment reform? Um, and this really should be built as a community market specific intervention that can leverage state leadership, but it's not a boil the ocean perspective that assumes all communities within a state or region are ready or able to embrace this approach. Um, and then the other point I was going to make is it's really important to get this right. And we know this is this happened, for example, in the pioneer ACO effort. We got to make sure that there's really strong readiness criteria. So readiness um, and necessary but not sufficient criteria. Uh, and there, I have some thoughts about what this would look like, but we have to make sure that the folks who are showing up for these APMs really do have uh, the right set of ingredients to be able to succeed. So those would be kind of my opening comments. And I'm really excited to hear additional uh, questions and thoughts. Uh, thanks, Frederick. Uh, lots to build on there in the further discussion. And I think um, our, our next speaker uh, definitely has some views and some um, uh, interesting ideas on, on these topics, uh, like uh, making these models more available to some of the underserved populations that most need them. Uh, Mark Smith, uh, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for your contributions in this particular area to that uh, the report that was just released. Well, well, thanks to you, Mark, and the Duke Margolis team for this, uh, this work. It's important. So I, I first want to co-sign what Frederick just said about how important it is to understand um, the incentives that currently exist. Uh, any discussion of health equity in America has to start with a major focus on Medicaid, which is hugely important both for insurance coverage for lower income people and also hugely important for the safety net institutions which serve them, 
both in explicitly covering Medicaid enrollees, but also as an important element of the kind of braided funding that explicitly and implicitly subsidizes the safety net that allows them to serve uninsured people. That's just the reality. Now, as many of the people on this call will know for, what was it, Mark, three years, I co-led with Mark yeah. the land, and our surveys consistently documented that Medicaid lags far behind Medicare and the commercial sectors in value-based payment. There are a lot of reasons for this, but one is clearly that FQHCs and critical access hospitals and behavioral health providers and others have a variety of payment systems hard fought hard won over many years that are firmly rooted in fee-for-service, in visits, in bed days, and all the sorts of things that we'd actually like to transition away from in terms of the way uh, providers are paid. And so if we want the Medicaid uh, uh, dependent providers to transition to a value-based payment, we have to pay close attention to their incentives and in my view, provide a variety of both carrots and frankly sticks to help incent them and provide them the support they need to move in this direction. So you asked Mark for me to have uh, three specific suggestions mm -hmm. for CMMI, and I almost always try to do what you asked me to do. And so I have three specific suggestions. The first is I think CMMI should require an equity lens in consideration and evaluation of all of its models. Now, I've read suggestions somewhere that the statute that enabled CMMI somehow needs to be amended to include equity. I'm not sure that's so. I'm, I, I think that might be a good thing, but the statute says that CMI, among other things, can do models that improve the quality of patient care without increasing spending. And I will remind everyone here that equity is one of the six domains of quality articulated by the IOM two decades ago. Now, say them with me now, safe, effective, patient-centered, timely, <laughs> efficient, and equitable. And so from my standpoint, at least, CMMI already has a remit to work on equity as a quality issue uh, around which its models can be, can be uh, centered. So we've already seen examples of payment decisions that have the unintended consequence of increasing disparity if you don't have an equity lens. We know that our system has areas of overuse, underuse, and misuse of various procedures, therapeutics, diagnostics. So an effort to reduce costs without acknowledging that there are systematic differences in where overuse and underuse reside runs the risk of inadvertently aggravating inequity. So I think the first thing CMLI should do, kind of similar to an environmental impact report, is to say whatever model we're looking at, let's consider how this might improve or worsen the existing inequities that we know exist all throughout the system. Number two, Don talked about having a vision of the system we want. My vision of the system we want is one in which people who are being taken care of in the safety net have provider-led organizations that can take clinical and financial responsibility for comprehensive longitudinal care. Not just primary care for FQHCs, behavioral health for SAMHSA clinics, inpatient care through public hospitals. And let me give you an example of why. Black people have disproportionate mortality from breast cancer and colon cancer. Now, some of that is due to delays in diagnosis which is related to insurance status and access to primary care. But even when you control for stage of diagnosis and age, black people have disproportionate mortality from cancer of colon and breast. And that leads to questions about the quality of care that people receive in the institutions in which they receive it. Their access to latest technology, to adequate specialty care, to inpatient care. So now don't get me wrong, I'm a big believer in primary care. I got a picture of Barbara Starfield somewhere here in my office. I believe in primary care. But if we're talking about being able to take high quality care of people in the safety net in the lower uh, quartile of our population, we have to have systems that can take comprehensive care of people that have insight into both the clinical and financial responsibilities. And for that, CMMI needs to invest in the kind of technical assistance that Don was talking about, but also needs to invest in the kind of 
elimination of the silos of funding from HRSA and CDC and SAMHSA and God knows who else, all of which are coming to the same institutions uh, tied to a fee-for-service rubric. Uh, and the third thing that I suggest CMMI should do is to look at value-based payment for emerging and expensive technologies and look at the existing or potential differential access to those technologies for Medicaid patients and even between Medicaid programs in different states. So the opening salvo for this in some ways was the cure for hepatitis. And this week we've seen the approval of a drug for Alzheimer's. Now, independent of your judgment about whether that's effective or not, one can see differential access to that and some of the things that are coming. In the next several years, there's the very real possibility of proven effective treatments for Alzheimer's, cures for sickle cell disease, cures for multiple myeloma, and the question of how we pay for the value of these expensive treatments and how we think about the amortization of what may be a lifetime cost as opposed to duly paying 80, 90, $100,000 a year to treat a sickle cell patient largely unsuccessfully, by the way, versus paying $400,000 in one chunk to cure that person of that disease. These are issues that, unless we get on them now, will, will fall to increase the disadvantage that people who are covered by Medicaid with the huge variation in prices paid in budgets and variations between states uh, will, will fall on them worse. So I think an important role for CMMI is to start thinking about models by which we can pay for these emerging, often curative technologies and, and pay for them in ways that pay for value and that can adjust to, to, uh, from a financing system that is used to paying for expensive and largely ineffective treatment to one where we're now paying for expensive and potentially curative lifetime treatment is something that we haven't talked about. It's so those a, are my three suggestions. Yeah, it, it's a great point. You can just almost see the, the biotechnology pressures driving uh, increases in uh, inequities if we don't do more to address it, not just the, the, the pricing, but the whole care models around um, how do you best take care of, uh, of a sickle cell patient or someone who is at risk of, uh, of cognitive uh, um, uh, decline, um, not something that we're well set up to do in these current uh, fragmented models. Uh, Mark, thanks very much. Lot, lots we could add on to there. Uh, let me go now to Sue Birch and uh, get more of a, a state perspective on all of this. Thank you, Mark. Good morning, and Mark and Frederick, it's so great to be with you. And Duke Margolis Center, thank you for in, um, inviting us to be in this important webinar. Uh, Mark, we, McClellan, we applaud your leadership on the land work you've done and for the center's fabulous new white paper on high value comprehensive care. We think it's spot on and works really well for where Washington is driving. So I wanna tell you quickly what Washington is up to and then I wanna give you my three pearls too or hints of what I think CMMI should be doing. So um, I am an executive nurse by background. I'm currently the director here in Washington for the Healthcare Authority. We're the state agency that purchases care for 2.7 million of our 7 million, seven and a half million folks in Washington. They're Medicaid enrollees, they're state and public employees. We also have the Compact of Free Association Islander Program. So we're subsidizing our COFA Islanders. And we launched um, Cascade Select, which is the nation's first public option program through our health benefit exchange. And these are important because access still in America is a big issue. And we in Washington feel strongly that getting everybody covered um, is, cannot go by the wayside. And we gotta regain some of the territory that has been lost in this nation. So as I said, we are the largest purchaser. We spend over a billion dollars a month up and, and uh, sometimes upwards of 15 billion annually, depending on the costs of certain things and what happens. But we really aim to purchase care much more efficiently. And as somebody said earlier, we don't wanna just pay more or pay for over medicalization. We really are trying to bring in the appropriate mix of medical and social um, evidence-based services. And we've made tremendous progress in implementing um, payment reforms and value-based purchasing. We've got alternative payment models. We've got a delivery system reform and innovation, uh, and we've got all sorts of affordability strategies. We began this journey in 2013. It was enabled by state legislation and also by our federal partners back then. Um, 
We had a SIM grant that um, helped us design and test cooperative agreements. It was followed by a Medicaid delivery system reform in 2017, and that, that was enabled through a DISRIP 1115 waiver. So we've had lots of progress, but I want to talk about a few of these. As of 2019, 62% of our healthcare spend for Medicaid, public employees, and school employees are in BBP contracts. We define that as 2C through 4B on that LAN uh, framework. All our contracts with our payers, TPAs, the Medicaid MCOs, the fully insureds, um, have some level of clinical and financial accountability. So we've been warming people up into this, we mean it, quality, alignment, and financial. Um, we've got direct contracts with providers, four direct contracts with providers. With uh, We have one with FQ8, um, our federally qualified health center clinics. We've got ACO program, and we have two centers of excellence programs, which are really quite remarkable. Another big lift in Washington that's really important is we financially integrated physical and behavioral health under Medicaid managed care. And I think from COVID, we all know that behavioral health needs to be strengthened for all covered lives in this nation. Critical gap when we're talking about um, kind of improved physical and uh, mental well being. We've also developed and implemented a very innovative Netflix type Hep C value based purchasing arrangement with AbbVie. And we are um, first or second state in the country to try to launch on a Hep C elimination. We are eager to get in and negotiate a shared savings um, framework with our federal partners. And that has to be part of this work because. Uh, there's enormous savings there. And then we have a very successful duals eligibility or duals demonstration going on that's yielding significant return on savings to their estate. So there's other complementary efforts in Washington going on around home and community based that I think worth merit um, discussing. That public option program, as, as I said before, it's got cost benchmarks to Medicare. It's got a primary care spend uh, floor compared to Medicare, and it's got quality and value components. This is really, really important. Uh, we had to follow up though with um, launching, I think the sixth cost transparency board in the nation. And we're trying to move the entire market towards tempering total cost of care. We're setting a benchmark, a, a growth benchmark. Also, one thing that Washington is first in the nation on as well is a long-term care trust, which is gonna provide a publicly funded long-term care um, program for all Washingtonians through a payroll tax. And it's a, a really, this is important because the more money we waste in aging and in over institutionalization of our elderly, the more we have um, less money to redistribute. So we've got to negotiate that shared savings with our federal partners too. That one really um, uh, calculates out at about a billion um, dollars of savings in a decade uh, environment. So early on, we, um, in this journey, we really acknowledge the importance of community health. We did things like formed accountable communities of health. We've got Indian healthcare providers implementing projects. We've got under that waiver, a huge focus on what we call foundational community supports. That's things like supportive employment and supportive housing. If people are in non-livable wage households, they're going to not have equitable health conditions. And we also intentionally began addressing health equity um, with this administration. Uh, and it's central and foundational to our next phase of work. We were really stalled out for the last four years on advancing with some of our equity efforts. But first we're trying to, uh, in the state, exemplify a culture of health equity and our governor stood up a huge investment in, in equity. We're reducing health inequities and improving all beneficiaries um, health status by a variety of um, goals I can talk about further. And we're partnering with communities to advance health equity because we know that all of this needs to be closer to the provider and to the communities because they are so uniquely different. So we're going to integrate health equity in all our purchasing strategies and promote integrated financing to support these population health by incentivizing life stages. Um, and these are the events that really derail you. So unintended pregnancies or unwanted pregnancies. These are kids that aren't able to read by third grade. These are kids that can't get out of high school or kids that can't get onto an apprenticeship type program. These are um, non-compliant uh, folks with their disease management process. So we have kind of a life stage approach where we're breaking down some of the social derailers and trying to make sure that we get people back on or keep them from derailing. So we really wanna equalize health. So I could go on and on about our current and future health equity strategies, but there are some that are really important. Um, 
we really want to increase access to care in all communities through telehealth modalities. That is really important thing we learned in COVID. We also, uh, here in Washington, we put out 6,000 phones. We put up all sorts of Wi-Fi. We did so much work with our Department of Commerce friends about broadband and equalizing the resources. We also um, know that primary care, the multi-payer primary care stuff, critically important. I could go on and on. We are definitely gonna double down on evidence-based maternity. Um, I just wanna say though, to Mark's comment about uh, working with the providers that um, can take clinical and financial risk, that's gonna be a real problem in the equity area because we know that things like community health workers and doulas and nurse practitioners aren't very organized in our world with CPT coding and whatnot. And so we have to look at what we're gonna to do to incentivize um, team-based care. So we, gotta, we can't just pay differently. We've gotta do the business process redesign and really build up a new workforce. Um, and we hope that HRSA and others uh, really um, bring some resources forward. So lastly, three things CMMI needs to do. They need to be the first mover on promoting health equity. They have to update the land framework to capture social needs and they've got to mandate, mandate the payment models. Um, we think that for states that are on board that this will be welcome relief to all our partners because everybody interprets and does things in so many different directions. They've also got to lead efforts to braid together the HHS silos of excellence. CMS, HRSA, CDC, SAMHSA, Medic CMCS, all these entities, they don't talk. We need them to really uh, give us the freedom. I see heads shaking, so I know you guys believe that. And we've got to work more closely with CMCS to align the 1115 waiver work and the alternative payment models. We've got to create new opportunities to partner on states, on customized multi-payer state-based models, absolutely starting with primary care. Um, we think our federally qualified health centers, alternative payment models, and our rural areas are very um, uh, foundational here in Washington, and we are eager to take them to the next level. So I want to thank you all, and I want to make sure that I end by saying we cannot just simply pay in a value-based way. We've got to stop wasting the over-medicalization and do that redistribution of um, resources, and we have to work side by side. This isn't just about, hey, we'll go out and buy. What we need to buy has to also be built. So it's an exciting time to think that we're going to be doing this hand-in-hand -hand with both our federal partners and our local partners. So thank yes. you all. Uh, Sue, thanks. Uh, lots going on in, in Washington. I appreciate your translating the vision to all of these uh, specific steps to make a difference. Um, I did want to go back. We got a little bit of time to, to follow up. I want to go back to a theme that, that Frederick brought up uh, first. Frederick asked you to follow up on this one related to readiness. And as we've just heard about, um, readiness, especially for uh, lower income populations that have been um, intended to get help through a, a lot of uh, well-meaning but fragmented programs programs um, to move that care into something that's more comprehensive. You mentioned the importance of readiness. And maybe you could expand a little bit on that. And as part of that, maybe touch on uh, some of the promising steps that you mentioned. Um, uh, Sue talked about these as well uh, and bringing communities together, like an accountable communities for health model or like some of the Medicaid-based waivers that are supporting um, uh, community efforts, not just to connect to community health workers, social services, but also to bring uh, more people to the table in, in getting confidence and implementing these models effectively. You bet, Mark. It'd be my pleasure. Let me take those um, in reverse. So um, this, you know, the model that we're talking about here, I think Sue just put it beautifully at the end of her, of her comments, which is um, fundamentally uh, to address some of the needs of most vulnerable populations, we have to understand those needs often fall outside of physical health. And in fact, if they're not met, their physical health outcomes can be much worse. So we have to get to a place where we're integrating those needs with um, the resources available in the community. And so the, the fundamental model we're talking about, which could be a CCO model in Oregon or an ACH model in Washington or a regional care organization in Alabama or um, the Hennepin Health model in Minnesota, right? There's all these different models uh, popping up is the notion that first and foremost, you have to start with data to understand that the, the spend and the needs of a community, right? With those data, and with community involvement, you can actually figure out what, where do we wanna prioritize? And this is really important because what we know over and over again with community work is if you don't allow community to set their targets, this will fail. You've gotta got have community involvement and engagement to understand where the community's energy and needs are self-identified with data to then be able to build really effective targets that lead to change. 
Um, fundamentally, as you were saying, Mark, when you're doing that, you've got to bring all the resources of the community together. So that means physical health, it means payers, it means government entities, it means social services, behavioral health, corrections, counties, public health, all together. This is happening. It sounds a little bit um, idealistic, but it actually is happening. It's happening effectively, right? When you bring those folks together, to get to Sue's earlier point, you can then start to think about how do we redistribute the resources? We're spending $4 trillion a year in this country in healthcare, right? How do we redistribute some of those resources to help fund this, the, uh, the community uh, entities that can, can solve those problems? How do we fund social services, behavioral health? Um, how do we make the right linkages between corrections and populations that are being, uh, that are coming into the public programs, et cetera, right? And then um, once you've done that, you establish what, how are we going to reduce the cost growth within this community and how are we going to make sure outcomes really are improving, right? And that's why I was really hitting on this notion that you got to make sure risk adjustment is well done so that you aren't actually penalizing providers who might have, you know, for example, I remember when I was working with public hospitals, one of the metrics, one of the first metrics CMS put out was um, around mortality rates. Um, and one of the risk adjusters for that was inter intersections with the healthcare sector, right? And that notion being the more you've intersected with healthcare sector, the more at risk you might be. Well, for some populations um, who have been disenfranchised and don't have coverage, they may never intersect with healthcare sector and then they might show up in your facility very, very ill, right? And that's a, an example of a misalignment of a risk adjuster. So anyway, so that's the kind of concept. When it comes to the readiness assessment, let me give a few key thoughts. First and foremost, and these readiness assessment criteria really come from what, looking at what's happening around the country and when it really works. First, this one's super simple, data interoperability. You gotta be able to exchange data across physical, mental, corrections, public health, social services. If those data are not available um, and interoperable, it gets very hard to do this well. Second, you gotta have the buy-in of key power bases, that includes state and local, local elected officials, public and private providers and payers, social service agencies, housing, human-based organizations, behavioral health and corrections. They, they all have to be willing to come to the table. Um, next, I would say, can you generate a five-year financial glide path that can be protected from elected officials, meaning that they don't come back in and try to rebase every year to allow for full financial migration? to really transform the provider community. And then the last thing is, um, and this one is always a surprise to folks, is a really thoughtful community engagement communication campaign. Um, if you look at what happened with the CCOs, um, they actually hired this phenomenal woman who was um, involved in campaign work earlier to really roll out a campaign strategy across Oregon to help communities understand what this was about, why it mattered, um, respond to questions and really get community buy-in. Um, and I think those are all examples of key readiness uh, criteria. Uh, thanks. So, so we've talked about in this panel some great discussion about why these shifts are important and what uh, comprehensive care really means uh, for uh, uh, addressing um, uh, health inequities and especially for serving uh, underserved or marginalized populations. Um, Frederick just uh, talked some about uh, uh, how to get there, uh, and Sue talk, talked about many steps they're taking in order to get there. So, so it's clearly, as Frederick says, and Sue is demonstrating, this is being done. Uh, but Mark Smith, it's not being done necessarily that widely. Uh, um, so I want to get to the question of what is it going to take to, to accelerate the, the progress here? You mentioned uh, some carrots and, and sticks. Uh, you care to elaborate a little bit more? Yeah, um, I wish I had a nickel for all the attempts I've seen and sometimes funded over the last 25 years of braiding together dis distinct areas of funding and getting people to collaborate, old habits die hard. <laughs> uh, asking people to give up FTEs, to give up part of their budget, to cede some of their autonomy to others. Um, uh, I'm, I'm glad when it works, but it doesn't often work just by voluntary means alone. And again, particularly within the safety net, these are institutions that are constantly under attack, that, that are constantly under the defense, on the defensive, and have fought for many years to build these special funding relationships. So well, for Frederick's point, for instance, the interoperability of data, 
Uh, Patty Gabal, who used to run Denver Health, and I wrote a paper comparing Denver to Oakland, California. In Denver, there was interoperability because there was one organization that all those different things were in. There was one medical record number. And if someone touched a school-based clinic or the ER or a, a mental health clinic or the inpatient hospital, there was one view of them. In Oakland, California, that's like 12 different organizations. So one issue is the interoperability of the data, but another and important one is a business relationship in which someone has that interoperable data, is accountable for the outcomes, and has the sufficient levers to move resources around to where they're necessary. So my own view is it's important to take readiness into account, but I think there'll have to be some changes in the incentives that face these organizations some of which they will be uncomfortable with because I, I get it. They're scared that the future will be worse than the present. But I think there has to be some combination of support, investment in their capacity, and, and frankly, mandating in, in the same way that we talk about mandating models with hospitals and docs that they may not be entirely comfortable with. I think the same thing is true here. Yeah, I think that it goes to the importance of, as we've talked about today, uh, the, the extent to which there's broad support for moving in this direction, uh, hopefully something that can be turned into uh, uh, a clear path, as well as pressure uh, to make these changes uh, happen faster. Sue, I'm going to give you the, the last word. We just got a, a minute or two left. Uh, uh, any final thoughts on how to accelerate progress here based on your experience? What do you need the federal government to do? What can uh, all these other uh, stakeholder perspectives that are represented here do to help make this happen faster and more effectively? Yeah, I think the two areas of weakness that we all really uh, need to own and strengthen are workforce redesign and multidisciplinary teams. And this is going to take extraordinary um, nursing and physician leadership, too. Uh, there, people don't typically get leadership and management skills. That's really important. Secondly, the whole person-centered approach. Our systems and our work is all designed on government systems and how it works for systems, not for the individual. And I think really mandating that we have clients at the center, persons, consumers, members. I want to stop calling them patients because we don't want more people in hospitals and facilities. So I just think we've got to really revolutionize the person-centeredness of all of this and get more of our clients directly onto boards and into these initiatives and harness, as Frederick pointed out, um, the community campaigns that need to go on. And, and Frederick talked about opportunities to do that. Actually, Frederick, I'm going to give you the last word. One minute on what you're, you're doing this at Families USA, trying to bring the people who are most affected by these programs right to the center and empowered to help uh, to help shape them. Uh, it seems like they're the ones who would want these kinds of changes, but often they're the ones who have the, the, the least trust of, you know, here we are from the government with a new program uh, intended to help you. That's right. Yeah. And, that, and we talked a little bit about how important it is to, to really think intentionally about that engagement and, and the organization an example where they were so methodical and and military militaristic about it. I mean the um, the governor and his staff really emphasized to, to us like they took a campaign approach. They went around the state and they really got involved in the community. They had advanced teams to explain what was going on. I want to just really underscore what Sue just said because it's like this whole other area that we really um, we you know that we don't talk about that often um, in payment delivery reform. But at the end of this, right, we're building a new healthcare system. And there is an enormous amount of work that needs to be done around um, our workforce. Um, and it's really, it's about making sure that we, you know, one of the things that can happen when we unleash ourselves from fee-for-service is we let our terrific providers who are so talented practice the top of their licensure, right? We really let them flourish but we also have to really think about the ways in which we're providing new models of care like community health workers that were that really are linkages in the community and we're thinking about how we're providing uh, ethnically and culturally appropriate care from providers who can really speak on behalf of and as part of the community those are all really integral elements as well and it's a beautiful vision of where we can get to when we do unleash ourselves from that fee-for-service treadmill Great. Um, I want to thank the panel for some excellent discussions. You know, a lot of people view these issues as really tough, uh, and they have been. People have been talking about them for, for a really long time, but uh, uh, I haven't seen uh, in, in my career um, the kind of unique opportunity we have now where there's a combination of, of real intent across so many different stakeholder groups, um, real pressure to make these changes, particularly around addressing equity, and more concrete examples of, uh, we didn't just talk about the big 
big picture policies. We were into RAF and uh, uh, details of specific policy reforms, workforce uh, uh, issues and the like. Uh, so it's not easy. A lot of pieces that have to come together, uh, but uh, some, some real opportunities. Thank you all for, for providing both some of that shared vision and uh, uh, clarity on how to get there. Um, we are obviously not done with this topic at uh, Duke Margolis. We're going to continue to bring together different perspectives and find uh, help to find and support the best path forward on uh, high value comprehensive care and other matters that matter that are so important to, to uh, people in this country and around the world. So I hope you'll uh, keep working with us. Uh, right now, I want to thank you all for attending. Also, a special thanks to West Health for their generous support for this webinar and many of our related projects, uh, reports, and activities around advancing uh, value-based care. And a special thanks to our team at uh, Duke Margolis, who did a lot of work on pulling this webinar together. As you can see, the webinar itself is, is great uh, when you have uh, these different perspectives together, but what really makes this work is all of the hard effort that goes into things like the report and listening to different perspectives and, and bringing together uh, analysis behind that. So special thanks to Rachel Royland, uh, Elizabeth Singletary, Rob Saunders, the rest of our payment delivery reform team, as, as well as Luke DeRocher and Patty Green from our events and communications uh, team as well. Uh, please be sure to take a look at those health affairs blogs that are just out on this topic that uh, and the new report on high value comprehensive care available on our website and we look forward to hearing from you stay in touch uh, this is uh, these efforts to work together are what really enable progress stay <laughs> stay safe stay healthy and hope to see you on future webinars and future collaboration opportunities.